challenges for large schools are meeting the students' needs. For a small school, it's even more challenging. So we listen to our students with their course selections. We select uh, or we load the classes based on what our students want. And uh, we make sure that we have the faculty in place to teach that. Uh, one topic that's come up quite a bit is upper level math. And Dr. Snow is able to teach any level of, of higher level math, but uh, you know, with your mom as a teacher, you don't want too many preps. And so uh, it's a balance between our teachers and student needs, um, we do try to fall on the side of students. So I'll open that to others who might want to add to my answer. Sorry about that, adding a few more. Um, so I guess what I'd additionally say to that is, um, you know, we're, we, um, as far as like the, the process goes, so um, I work with Miss Dugan and right now she's the one that's um, kind of taken the lead on um, going uh, through all of the offer letters right now. And I believe she's done with that process. Um, and then she's also the one that um, the staff are indicating to whether they're coming back or whether they're not and kind of keeping us informed. And so what we're doing right now is we're working with kind of the the real data that we have, um, because that's what we have to work with. Um, and then we're also working with um, some of the staff that we know that are coming back to kind of find out ways and how can we improve by gathering some of their ideas. So I know I've been um, working with um, Mr. Schaumberger, um, gosh, I don't know how many times we've met on just some of the kind of big ideas that he has on um, what he'd like to see for next year. Um, and then we're trying to connect the right kind of people with like the, the kind of similar ideas to see if we can get them up and running. So a lot of it is listening right now um, and then seeing how can we take what we're hearing and implement. Sometimes there are things that we can't implement. Um, they're just too far out of our control. And sometimes there are things where we can say, yeah, that we can totally move on that. Um, so there's, um, so that's kind of where we're at with that part that I can share from my perspective. Okay. We have a, we have a few more students join. So in the interim, I just wanted to welcome everybody who's joined us. Thank you so much. Um, for taking the time to hop on this Zoom call. Um, I wanted to just go around and introduce the admin that we have. We have Dr. Euchre, and then we have Miss um, Liz Dugan. She's the K-12 head of school. And then we have Miss Anna Magley-Habrek. She's our secondary director. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Johnson, who just joined us. She's our director of curriculum and accountability. And then we have Miss Stephanie Webb. And um, she, we work with her, she's our office manager, but also kind of she manages it, everything enrollment and infinite campus. So quite a few people that um, are here to answer any questions that you have and then any topics that you wanna chat about. So um, I wanted to give Dr. Euchre an opportunity to um, welcome everybody. So Dr. Euchre. Thank you and welcome uh, to this forum, students. Uh, always love meeting with students, hearing what's on your mind. Uh, STEM School Highland Ranch exists for students. We never forget that we are here to serve you. Um, that said, I know it's been a tremendously challenging COVID year for teenagers uh, worldwide. Um, students have really struggled uh, and I am so thankful that for most of the year we've been in person. And if you reflect back, um, if you thought of last year, if we were virtual only, how that would not have been a good um, place for you all to be. And so many students across America have not been in person since last March, a year ago, March. So the fact that our students have been able to come to school, be with their teachers, be with their friends, has been a tremendous plus for our school and our community. 
I've met with teachers um, and I encourage teachers, many teachers have said they feel so much stress and I say, just enjoy your students. Um, this time of year, we have the best students anywhere. Um, they're young and bright and eager. And um, when you are teaching them, don't feel any internal standard, um, just enjoy them as you do your PBL. They, uh, our students, as you know, are so easy to get to know and you're so bright um, that good PBLs engage you um, in a way that uh, other schools really struggle with. So I encourage our teachers to enjoy the last part of the school year. Uh, it's such a celebratory time for you and your families. And hey, we're gonna have prom. Uh, so that's fantastic. So with that, I will turn it back to our Director of Communications, Nicole Bostel. Thank you. Um, so this is kind of the time where we just kind of open it up by you can ask us questions. Um, the only thing I would just ask is um, that we just try not to talk over each other because I know that sometimes that's hard with um, everybody wants to get their uh, questions out. So feel free to use that hand raise button and then that might just help us kind of keep it all in order, but otherwise we're open to questions. Um, I have a question. Sure. Um, why can't Flexible Fridays be implemented next year? Okay, so um, I can, um, Dr. Uecker, you've done, a, you've seen a lot more of the information coming from CDE. So do, would you like to take that one? Yes. So the rules have changed um, as far as what we can offer. And the reason we had Flexible Fridays this year was to give our teachers time to build content for the next week um, because they were doing the dual platform of in-person and virtual. What we heard from our parent community is that they wanted five days a week in school. That said, um, we have always offered virtual Fridays uh, case by case. Uh, we have students on ski teams, uh, students who have specialized needs uh, to have Fridays virtual. Um, it won't be a teacher teaching virtually, um, but um, there is a possibility case by case for a student to apply for virtual Fridays. In fact, that's where the name originated, <clears throat> excuse me, for our students who had that specialized need. And so to just, I'm sorry, um, just to follow up. Um, so CDE is, um, as, as we went into this year, they were they had not updated what their guidelines were uh, around kind of virtual remote learning. So when we went into this COVID timeframe, they had to do some adjusting to their guidelines. Um, and so they, they to, to make it easy for all, because um, we have schools in various different um, rural, urban, suburban areas, um, they added the, uh, the component of synchronous or asynchronous, sorry. Um, because not everybody has access to the technology that they needed. Well, now as COVID has gone on and virtual learning has expanded and people have gotten access to more um, technology, they've now added the requirement for asynchronous that needs to be included in that virtual component. And so as we head into next year, the ability for us to be able to offer just a kind of virtual type Friday would need to have um, a large component of synchronous involved in that. And so trying to balance that with our ability to return back to five days in-person learning um, is, good, is too much of a challenge in order for us to take that on as a single school. If it was something that DCSD was looking at doing um, district-wide, then maybe there'd be a little bit more buy-in to it. But I think as of right now, for us to try and do that, um, at a, at, for us just as a school, I think that would be a little bit too hard logistically. Sorry, you had another question. Uh, I, I did, yeah. Um, this, this isn't, uh, I didn't ask that last question, but uh, I do have a question, a multi-part question. Uh, number one, um, you know, I'm gonna go right into it. What's up with our teacher turnover? We're at 44% this year. That is nowhere near parity, Douglas County or Colorado or the United States, according to the uh, Colorado Department of Education, uh, which we're over double what Douglas County's teacher turnover is. 
um, and we're near triple what the administrator turnover for Douglas County uh, is. Um, and you know, number two, um, why is there a need to right size our staff, seeing as there has not been a significant change in terms of income over the last uh, number of years? Um, why, why is there a need to right size our staff, uh, especially given the current pandemic? Okay, so for the first part, Dr. Yuker, do you want to take that first part? No, I'll take that back in. And um, again, to all of our students on the call, so appreciate uh, you bringing these hard questions to us. Um, we really appreciate being able to speak to you directly on these. Teacher turnover, uh, we don't know yet. Um, the data posted on CDE is a year or two years old. Uh, this year has been devastating for teachers across the country. It's been devastating for school principals, for superintendents. Every superintendent in the metro area uh, decided it was just too much and they left during the school year. So teachers nationally, according to Education Week, they're predicting uh, between 40 and 50% will leave the profession. So we're fighting this national um, exodus from a very stressful situation between COVID, the extra demands, the stress, and most of our teachers have families that they also take care of. So we are trying to do everything we can uh, to bring back the fun. Uh, uh, Mr. Schallenberger has launched a campaign, um, bring the fun back in dysfunction because we see our school as a collection of eccentric um, students and faculty who are uh, who really enjoy uh, pushing the boundaries. I mean, that's who we are. That's why you were attracted to this school. And where did we lose the fun? Um, it was a stressful year. We did decide to stay in person. 60% of our faculty did not agree with that decision. 40% wanted to come back, 60% didn't. We, we surveyed our parents and overwhelmingly um, they wanted their students in school. So you can see why administrators leave. It's a no-win situation when you have the majority of your teachers not wanting to come back in person and the majority of your family is demanding it. What happens when you don't meet family needs is they go to schools that do meet their needs. And for every 25 children we lose, uh, we lose one teacher. It's just the ratio of funding. We are a low funded public school. We're funded like Douglas County schools. And so we have to, um, we have to be very careful with how we staff to make sure that we are sustainable. And what happened over the past two years, well, this past year, uh, we were able to secure a PPP loan, a payroll protection loan from the SBE, which was $2 million. And that let us keep enough, uh, all of our teachers. So even if your class had eight students and another class that that teacher had had 15 students, well, we could have combined those and then right-sized this past fall. But because we got that loan, we said, we're gonna sustain all of our faculty through this year, but next year we won't have that loan. So uh, we can't keep teachers when we don't have enough students to pay that salary. And I'd, I'd like Dr. Johnson to speak to how many classes uh, were significantly below our target of 25 students per teacher. Thanks, Dr. Uecker. So, um, and Becca, and thanks for the question. We appreciate that. Um, when we looked in January, uh, we ran a report looking at our class sizes across the secondary level. We had 53 classes that had less than um, 20 students in them. We build our master schedule based on 25 students. And so um, there was that leeway as, as well. We didn't look at 20 to 25, we looked at 19 and below. So 53 sections of having students anywhere from, there were some classes that have six students and other classes that um, had 19, something like that. So um, it's important for us to take a look at that. And and um, I know that, that we can do better. Um, last spring and summer, 
we built our master schedule and we didn't want to change anything that was in the master schedule for um, that support for staff and students. But as we move forward, um, we need to, to make some of those hard decisions, unfortunately. Uh, I had a quick question adding on to your answer about that. Uh, you mentioned that we have over 53 classes with less than 20 students. The average school is able to maintain a peer to teacher ratio of 18 students. Having anything over 18 is an excessive amount. So those classes are actually what they should be at. And I'm kind of curious to where your funding is going, considering that you're saying that we have to reduce our staffing by 10% when already 40% of them are leaving by choice. And not to mention that we just bought a new building across the street. So I'm just curious to where the money is going that we can't maintain our staff. So um, I can start with a portion of so, that um, ratio. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, um, as far as the funding with the building next door, so what was purchased with the building next door, um, we have three different buckets on how we handle our um, finances. So teacher salaries and benefits all are in one particular bucket. And then in another bucket is our operations. And then in another bucket is facilities. So nothing was taken away from teachers in order to purchase the building next door. In fact, it was purchased by going to bond. So that is money that when we go to bond, that's actually money that we can't utilize towards teacher salaries. So that means that we're putting it out there and there are investors that like our school and that wanna invest in it. And so um, the, what they're purchasing are is they're putting an investment into our school and that frees up capital in order for us to purchase. So um, just to clarify that component of it, that the two are not associated and we're not taking away one from the other. Um, Dr. Ewer, could you talk a little bit more about the funding um, as far as Douglas County goes? And then, um, uh, and then could you speak to that enrollment piece? So, um... Colorado is one of the lowest funded states for public education in the country. If you Google that, you can see, depending on how you look at it, we're anywhere from 38 to 40 something out of 50 states. So we get roughly about 8,000 per student plus mill levy override. And if you look at Wyoming, they're over 15,000 per student. If you look at Baltimore schools, they're 28,000 per student. Um, so we are an extremely low funded school. And even within Colorado, suburban schools are funded less than rural and suburban, I mean, urban schools. So our school and uh, the schools in Fort Collins are the lowest funded practically in the country. And people marvel, how can you even run a budget with uh, such a tight uh, amount of funding? So we have to uh, be very cautious in how we spend money. We're very frugal. Uh, we make sure that it goes to what we most value, which is our teachers. And so we look at Douglas County pay scale and they start their teachers at 39,000. We start our teachers at 40,000. And we make sure that we are always at least $1,000 uh, higher than Douglas County across where our teachers are paid. You can't compare, some of our parents have compared our teacher pay to other districts. Well, they're funded in a different way. So you could only compare us to Douglas County schools. And then as far as per pupil or how many students in a class, how those get calculated um, are not the same. They will count other people in that ratio. So if a school says they have 18 to one, uh, they are counting other things as well. So if you look at our ratio, um, it's much lower than our actual load factor. So most schools in Douglas County and neighboring counties uh, load their classes um, between 35 and 42 students at the secondary level, especially high school. And so if you query teachers in neighboring high schools, they'll say, oh yeah, I have 35, 42 students. And in fact, that was their complaint about coming back after um, spring break when they had to go back and teach in person at Jeffco. They said, how am I gonna separate 42 students? And we never put 42 students in one of our classrooms. Uh, we, we try to cap it between 25 and 28. Uh, a few of our honor sections and AP sections inch up to about 30, 32. 
Um, but the ratio overall to make our school work financially is 25 to one. I would also like to speak to the enrollment. Um, as you know, we have had a significant loss of enrollment um, since 2019. And um, we did have a slight uptick this year of additional 10 students from the year before. But overall, we're looking at an enrollment loss of 175 students. So um, that significantly impacts um, our, our PPR, our, what the money that we get to, to fund our teachers. So, and as Dr. Yuka had mentioned, you know, 25, the loss of 25 students means the loss of a teacher. So we've been carrying that extra teacher load for the last two years. And, and when she says we need to right size and we need to adjust for the projected enrollment that we're going to have for next year, which will be more than likely a hair bit less than what we had this year. So just something and, to think about. And Mrs. Webb, will you also add um, how many students we lost, even though you're secondary students and it may not register with you, but uh, how many students we lost at elementary because we did not do five day in person? I My estimate is we lost about 10 to 15 students not offering the five day a week option for our families this year. So um, that was a very big factor, driving factor in some of our enrollment loss for this year. Um, hopefully next year we may gain them back. Um, the potential is there. Um, our elementary is looking good. Um, most of the um, classes are filled. It is our middle school and our high school where we do see the largest deficits of students. Can I ask why that is? Because I know there's uh, multiple wait lists that are, you know, several hundred students long or is advertised that there's wait lists that are several hundred students long. Um, if you guys control who, who's admitted, why are we having loss of students? So can answer that one. She manages our wait list. So the wait list currently as of today has 207 students on it. Um, 49 of them are waiting for kindergarten. Um, I have another 30 or so that are waiting for first through third. I have 100 that are waiting for fourth and fifth. Um, and then I have a small smattering of students between six through 12th. Um, I would say the largest, I think seventh, I have 10 on the list. Um, all of the others are below five. So it, the wait list is quite healthy for the um, elementary level, but it is not for the secondary and high school levels. Um, and uh, somebody, had, I'm sorry, I think it was um, Beck, and I think you had mentioned about the 44% teacher turnover. So what we're, if, if I could just, so it's, um, uh, I can give you more exact figures if you'd like. If we're just talking about teacher turnover, we're actually only at about 18% if we're looking at K through 12, okay? Um, and that's with the teachers who have, who have told us, which means that they have not accepted their offer letter or they've indicated on their intent to return that they're not coming back or that they have submitted that their resignation. If there's a teacher that is contemplating it, we don't factor that in, right? Because they still haven't made that decision. So we have to actually work with the real data. So we're at 18% of our teacher turnover. So um, we have, I, and that's counting K through 12. And if you, I, I'm happy to go into that data and, um, you know, I've been talking about it with parents constantly. Um, I know so it's, if we, if we're talking about staff, that number could be different. Okay. And we're talking about positions that we have that were filled that are currently filled and for those that are not coming back. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm mainly talking about like student facing um, staff. So, you know, counseling, because I know we're losing, I think somewhere around four uh, members of our counseling department, including our college and career counselor, yes. um, which is a huge, huge, huge loss for the school. And it quite frankly puts the rest of uh, many, many high school students um, path forward um, in a little bit of jeopardy. Um, and, you know, with that, I think that you, you, you can't just count teachers. You have to kind of look at overall staff staff loss rate right, as opposed to opposed to just teachers and I would I would appreciate going into that data a little bit more um, because you know I think it's important that we also look at those who are looking at leaving um, and why they're looking at leaving if, if it's something outside of you know teacher pay and benefits yeah and so we do have um, a like an HR I think we call it HR consultant so she is completely separate from STEM um, she works independently 
and staff um, have her contact information and they can go to speak to her anonymously. They can do their exit interviews with her. They can provide anonymous feedback. Um, and I believe we have her, um, she's only, I think the last time we checked, we've only had two staff members that have kind of reached out to her that she has at least communicated back to us as far as when she gets either a complaint or when she gets feedback that we need to look at that's what she shared with us. So we do have that component that that provides that kind of anonymous, that way a teacher doesn't feel or a staff member doesn't feel like they need to go to an admin person um, or an admin member um, in order to provide that feedback. Now the teacher might not feel comfortable and the staff member might not feel comfortable saying what their plans are. Um, if they're planning on leaving, they might not be ready to share that. And that's hard because I don't know about you, but I wouldn't feel comfortable walking around every single day going, are you leaving? Are you leaving? Are you staying? I mean, that puts somebody in a very uncomfortable situation. So, um, you know, when they share that information with us, and if they want to share the reason why they're leaving, they can, but they can also, um, they have access to an independent person um, that they can share their feedback with. May, may I add that um, I, I think that, you know, teachers may not feel comfortable going non even anonymously because as we've seen, um, the school's not afraid to sue somebody even anonymously. Uh, I believe you guys filed a defamation lawsuit against the parent um, who reported very legitimate concerns a number of years ago, um, proceeding into now May 7th. Um, so, you know, I think that it's very important that we look at not just anonymously, um, but we have a, just, we need a kind of a, a shift of, from the top down of a culture in which it's not feared um, to, to bring feedback. And I know that teachers have brought up many times that there is a culture of fear amongst the staff, that there is a feeling that there's going to be some amount of retribution. That's something that's not appropriate, uh, in my opinion. I think that that's something that, um, you know, quite frankly, should be looked into by the Colorado Department of Education. But I also want to bring up um, that, you know, I think that there is, to, to some extent, a need for, for innovation amongst our teachers. And I think we, we, always, we always look at ourselves as very very innovative school. And I would offer that probably the number one biggest thing that I've heard from students in terms of how we could become more innovative is giving our teachers tenure. If we give our teachers academic tenure and they have job security and they're not on edge um, because, because they're afraid that they're not gonna be re-offered a contract, um, it's going to be a much better environment for students. It's gonna be a much better environment for teachers. It's going to allow way more collaboration uh, between teachers and students because you know, we know that our teachers are going to be with us for as long as they want to be with us. It's not going to be because of administration, because of the school that they want to learn, that they're going to be forced to leave. Um, and further, you know, they're going to feel more empowered to bring issues, to bring to bring problems that, that could be fixed by administration uh, to administration and really, really, really further that cause of helping our students and helping our students succeed uh, in the long term. Uh, yeah, long term. I just want to say, has that, has that been thought about uh, giving teachers tenure? Because uh, I know that was something that was relatively popular during the 20th century. It's kind of fallen out of style a little bit in favor of budget cuts. Uh, but I, I know that I've spoken to some individuals outside of outside STEM and inside within STEM um, who have said that they, they would be willing to take, you know, a little bit less money and, and some fewer benefits for job security and for that knowing that they're going to be with us, with their students long term or as long as they want to be. So Beckin, what I would say is we encourage our teachers to take risk, um, to be as creative as they would like for problem-based learning, to build their personal brand. We pay for national conferences if they are presenting. And we encourage our teachers uh, to go large. You know, we have amazing students who will follow them to very creative uh, problem-based learning. Um, when I go into a classroom and I see it noisy and students are engaged and arguing and talking about whatever it is they're working on, that just really makes me happy to see that kind of engagement. And if you've been with us for a while, you know um, it would spill out into the hallways. Our students would constantly be working in the halls in small groups on topic and I would constantly bring through tours and we'd confer with students in the halls and our visitors would always be amazed with the high engagement of our students. Somehow, maybe it was a COVID world, maybe it was two years ago, I don't know, 
but somehow uh, that excitement of learning and really enjoying students has fallen away. And I think everyone feels that. And so that's what I opened with that I, when I confer with teachers, I say, just enjoy our students. Uh, go back to what got you into education and uh, you know, just enjoy the last part of the school year with high level, or whatever excites you for PBLs. Our students want that, they need that. Uh, and as um, Mr. Shao said, let's bring the fun back and dysfunction in the sense that that quirkiness that defines our school, uh, we need to find that and get back to it. The, the, um, the idea that there's fear, um, I can honestly say, I don't get involved with hiring or firing. Um, there's a lot of urban myths about me and I encourage you to get to know me more. Uh, I, there's nothing that motivates me more than serving teachers. I spent most of my career as a teacher and I know that teachers want, uh, they want the creative freedom. That's what I wanted as a teacher uh, to, to do the exciting things that got me into education. So um, I think we're gonna renorm our culture next year to have fun, to get back to students excited about coming to school, working on problem-based learning, our teachers being creative and collaborative. And for those who just got too beat up in a COVID world, um, maybe it's best for their mental health to find what makes them happy. Uh, but those who are returning, uh, the expectation for all of us is that we contribute to a positive, supportive, nurturing culture next year. Yeah, I would hope I would hope that that would be the case um, because I have I have heard from multiple individuals, um, per, yeah, individually um, and you know without conference amongst each other that there is absolutely a culture of fear amongst teachers at STEM, and I don't want that with my teachers. Uh, because I don't think I'm going to be learning the best if I have a teacher who's scared that they're going to get fired for bringing up um, or, you know, not renewed for bringing up a uh, concern that they have with administration or or with an established individual within the community or something like that. Because, I'm, you know, there's a number uh, of, in of instances of this actually having happened. So, you know, thank you. Um, you brought up an, an idea of tenure. Um, that's actually the first time I've heard about it. I don't know about the rest of the team. Um, so I think it's, um, the team could probably chew on that and <laughs> think about that. I just didn't want you to think that we didn't hear you on that one. Um, uh, of the feedback that we received through the staff feedback team, I don't know if I've actually seen that on there over the last year, but the team can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I mean, it's definitely, it's an idea that I think is out of the box. Um, so, but there are those that would have to make that decision about. <laughs> so, um, uh, there's I, I, there's a couple of questions that are in the chat box, and I'm so sorry I'm not I'm not because we're we're talking live, so, so we might not be able to um, answer to all of them. Um, there was one: uh, if you aren't in charge of hiring or firing, who is? And so, um, Dr. Yu, would you want to touch on that? Yes, yeah, so um, the building level supervisor, if they see a concern, a safety concern um, regarding a faculty member, and you can all reflect back if um, one of your teachers, uh, and of course we can't speak to specifics, but if one of your teachers was behaving in ways that made students feel unsafe, it came to us either through parents or through uh, students or through direct ob observation. So uh, sometimes it's the coach, sometimes it's the building level administrator says this is a concern and uh, we do an investigation. And if it's determined that student safety is at risk, um, we confer with our school's attorney and our board, and it's a collective decision to protect students. We absolutely um, have to ask this teacher to go. And so on the right sizing, um, we look at class load on what teachers, when we right size, that's a whole different thing. And that's a collective uh, of the entire administrative team who can best teach this class, who has the qualifications. Um, ACC is very strict and gets stricter every year. For example, CE English, 
Um, we've had teachers in the past that we did not keep because they did not want to change. They wanted to stay with CE, but ACC said, you don't have the qualifications to continue teaching this course. And actually that's how uh, Mr. Cooper came to us. He was an adjunct um, because he did have the qualifications. He's a great teacher. Um, and so he continued with us. So when I say I don't get involved with hiring and firing, I don't make those decisions, but sometimes those decisions come to me um, from people who make direct observations or from things like I said with CE, um, when a teacher doesn't want to teach um, what they're not qualified for. So, um, but in, in general, for example, we just hired a new administrator. I was not part of any of the interviews and the decision of the team, which included students and parents was unanimous or just about. And I was as surprised as anyone of who they selected. And because we have a process that includes a lot of views and not mine, uh, the person that emerges as the selected person, I'm always excited. So just to follow up on that a little bit. Um, so we only had one teacher this year during the school year that we had that we deemed was not a good fit. Okay, and that was a decision that was made by the building director um, who brought that to Dr. Uger just to confer. Um, but that was uh, the decision of that building director to um, not uh, continue with that particular teacher. Um, so now this particular year, we did not go, so there's there's a couple of, um, I guess we should say a couple of terms that we use. So a reduction in force is what we call a RIF, okay? That's when um, you could also, in some cases, call that a non-renewal, but that happens actually prior to the non-renewal process. Um, and that's done when we're looking at um, do we have enough of the students? And the, Dr. Uper kind of touched on this a little bit. Do we have enough students in order to support that teacher in that particular area? Sometimes we're overstaffed. So for instance, if we have too many in language arts and we don't have enough students to support all of those teachers in language arts, then we do a reduction in force in one language arts teacher. That's just an example there. Now, this particular year, we did not do any actual like non-renewals and that would have been in the case of let's say um, a in pre as we have in, in years previous where there's an evaluation that's tied to that or some type of feedback uh, loop that's tied to that. So we did not do that this year um, due to COVID. We did not do teacher evaluations. So we went from a reduction in force to intent to return forms where teachers would then indicate whether they were planning on returning or not returning. Um, they can indicate their reasoning why if they so choose. Um, some of those reasons, we did have a teacher that is um, not coming back because of retirement. Um, we have another teacher that's not coming back due to moving. Uh, we have another teacher that indicated she wanted um, an admin position um, and which we didn't have and then um, the rest of the teachers did not indicate kind of a reason why, um, which they don't have to on that particular form. Then what we do is we take the pool of teachers who have indicated that they are intending to return, and then we build their offer letters off of that. So that's how the process kind of works. So I hope that that um, answered some of that. And Kaylin, thank you so much. You've been having your hand up for a while. Caitlin. Uh, yeah, so I, um, I'm i currently the head of the Student Advisory Committee, and one of the members of it brought up, brought to my attention an Instagram account that was started, uh, the STEM Stands for Teachers protest that I believe is being run by a group of students, uh, and they brought up a lot of concerns. I looked at their thing, and they brought up a lot of concerns that I think we've been discussing in this meeting. I was wondering if you guys are aware of that or have seen it, and if so, what you guys are planning to do to work on those concerns they brought up. Yeah, so um, I think we, I mean, I know I've seen it um, and I have shared it with admins so that they are aware of it. Um, a lot of, like, you know, like you said, a lot of the topics are on here. Um, we'd love to, um, we don't know who started it, but, you know, these types of forums are a great place to have that discussion. Um, I, I think that there was a discussion that part of the post was to go to the board meeting, um, which is great. Sign up for public comment if you want to come. Uh, the one thing that I would 
um, say that um, with going to the board meeting, um, I think sometimes the perception is that there will be discussion around the public comment that you make. And so that actually doesn't happen during a board meeting. So you can do public comment. And then what happens is the board reflects on it. And then there's a response that's done within 30 days of that board meeting. So it's actually not discussed. So your actual public comment itself is not actually discussed at the board meeting. So um, student forums such as this are actually the perfect way to bring those types of concerns so that we can address them here um, and kind of create more actionable items with, with Dr. Euchre does is she then takes what the team works on and she includes that in her director's report to the board. So um, if you've been to a board meeting, if she's um, she has the information that we receive from students, then she presents that. So in particular, one was um, shared with the board about um, the teacher and the students um, request to go asynchronous on Fridays. And that was shared with the board that that was a request and something that they wanted to move on. Um, and then we do have usually one or two student representatives that present to the board and that is their opportunity to share um, what they're working on but additionally if there's any anything that they would like the board to consider um, they can present that during that that time frame as well excuse me excuse. Um, i have a few questions um first off you mentioned earlier that you are here to serve the students i'm so uh, sorry i can't um you're really low i can't hear what your question is Okay, you mentioned earlier that you're here to serve the students as an administration team. However, do you get any um, I'm not sure if anyone else caught that. I wasn't able to. It's a little bit too far away from the microphone. Anything else? It's really, really faint. Is that a yes? Um, uh, let's go ahead. Luke had his hand up. So Luke, do you want to go ahead? And... Yeah, I just wanted to say since COVID, the problem based learning has gone down. And that's something that I would really like to see rekindled in future years. You and me, Luke, that is who we are as a school. I so appreciate you saying that. Um, I was able to view um, some great PBLs this past week. Our seventh graders are doing the classic uh, Holocaust Museum. Uh, I'm excited to see their products on Friday. Elementary, um, fifth grade did the reenactment. Uh, first grade did Marketplace. Kindergarten is going to do their inventors. So you're right, Luke, uh, PBLs, that's who we are, and let's knock it out of the park next year. Let's all work together to support teachers taking risk um, and encouraging them. You know, and I know uh, when you do a PBL for the first time, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, and that's okay. Our students are wonderfully collaborative to give feedback to the teacher um, on ways that we can improve it. So our hope, uh, we put a lot of resources to our teachers for next year. Uh, Maura Ritter and uh, Michelle Gasser are heading up that. Uh, we will have a full-time PBL coach uh, for secondary and uh, Michelle Gasser will help with PBL at elementary as well as Simi Basu will also help teachers where they might need help with technology in the PBL. So next year, um, look for a lot of PBLs. I'm hoping to see students back in the hallways working on their projects and get that life and energy back in our school. Yeah, thanks. That sounds great. Thanks, Luke. Um, Caleb, uh, you had your hand up. Did you want, excuse me, did you want to ask a question? Um, yeah, I was wondering, uh, did you have any updates on potentially changing the schedule to traditional? Oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> so um, we were, were hoping to get something out this week. Um, we wanted, so our teacher task force has been meeting um, a couple of times and we've got several of the admin that are on that as well. Um, 
uh, that are part of that task force. Um, and so what, what, um, what we decided to do is bring, um, at the request of the task force, um, on the 16th of April, we brought in the scheduling consultant that we had worked with. Um, we, we work with her every year to just kind of take a look at what our schedule looks like. Is it, uh, well, I don't know if we worked with her last year. I can't, I don't know if we did that. <laughs> yes, okay, we did. Um, so we bring her in, she takes a look at um, uh, everything that we offer. She takes a look at our staffing and she gives us recommendations as to how to kind of maximize um, not only just um, our teachers and students, but the, our building itself, because our building limits how many classes we can offer and where we can put them. So there's a lot of factors that go into the planning. So they wanted to meet with her. Um, so she, they met on the 16th of April um, and she gave them uh, just really, it was two and a half hours long. We just went through all different kinds of ideas. Um, and where we landed on right now is that we're gonna stay with um, block scheduling for six through 12. Um, so everything will remain the same for next year. The feedback that we got from students and from families was overwhelmingly that they wanted to stay in the block schedule. Um, and so our, despite the, the, the feedback that we got from teachers that was um, where they really wanted us to consider moving to traditional, uh, I think the task force really looked at um, the limitations that moving to a traditional schedule would have on our students and the offerings that we could have. Um, and so we went back to looking at the schedule and then how can we still add back in um, with the enrollment that we have, the projected enrollment and the um, course, the number of students that have selected each course, how can we still try and add back in the planning time that some of our teachers need? So we had, we came up with a list of, a, um, I think we're calling them agreements or adjustments to the proposal, or <laughs> I'm not sure how we landed on the verbiage of that, but that was sent on um, Friday to the teachers, to the secondary teachers so that they could review it. And then this week they're having the opportunity to review the actual master schedule to, so that they could see what it would look like specifically for them next year. Um, and what it would look like if they would have two planning periods, um, if they would have um, a potential to co-teach with somebody, which was one of the um, uh, options that the teachers want to go look at. So instead of teaching seven, they could potentially teach 6.5, um, reducing their number of preps, which would mean kind of maximizing their schedule a little bit more. So moving a teacher who might like for instance, in middle school who could potentially be teaching sixth, seventh and eighth graders, moving them to where they only te teach one particular grade. So their preps um, aren't so many. So there was a lot of um, those kind of adjustments that were proposed that were accepted. Um, and so we're hoping that um, either tomorrow or, the, or Thursday, we can share out um, what the plan is moving forward. That's really good news. It was a long-winded answer to that question, but I just wanted to provide that background because they've been meeting um, every single week um, and they've, they've really, um, just the whole team, so teachers and leadership um, have been um, in really creative ideas. So this um, teaching 6.5 classes was something that we had tried in the past with a couple of teachers and um, uh, a really creative idea that I think could actually help um, a new teacher coming on board that they could potentially co-teach a class with a veteran teacher who's um, who will be back. So there's some support that comes in through that. Um, and then some additional supports to kind of help with grading and all of that. So we're hoping to share that out within the next day or two. So. Um, sorry, I'm just looking at a question. Um, uh, Delaney, would you like to answer your question and your hand was raised? Oh, you mentioned earlier um, at the beginning of this meeting that you as an admin team are here to serve the students. But I was wondering if you got any student input on the next, on the grading system for the incoming year with the one, two, three, four, and fives, and how this system is gonna negatively impact the student GPAs, especially those in high schoolers who have to consider college. So that's with the standards-based learning or standards-based grading that we're moving toward. And um, Dr. Yu, do you want to touch on that? 
I, I'll, I'll um, start with that. And then any on the team who would like to add, I welcome uh, your perspective. And too bad we don't have Maura and Michelle on the call because they are the experts. But um, I always compare it to when you go for your driver's license or permit, you know from the booklet the skills you need and the knowledge you need to know. And you know how many points you have to do to get to get your driver's license. It's very transparent, it's very clear. You know, and I know every student, and I hear from parents, the stress of going from teacher to teacher and each teacher devises their own system of what they count. Does homework count? Uh, um, do they clearly define the learning objectives for the course? It's all over the map. And there's no equity in that. There's huge stress in that. So yes, changing the system is super scary for high school. And so what we want to make sure that no students feel, no student feels that they um, have been harmed by that um, change of system. What we're hoping is our parents clearly see, just like the driver's um, license booklet, they clearly see what are the learning objectives what are the examples, for example, um, CE uh, English, if you write an essay and it gets marked a three, um, they will have examples of threes. So you as a student and your parent can see um, why is that a three? And the beauty of it is you will get feedback and then you can improve it because what we're looking at, just like the driver's license, if you fail, it's not forever you can come back and take it again to show you actually achieved that knowledge and skill. Um, so next year, K-12, we're gonna be very transparent. And of course it's a learning process for our faculty and we're putting resources to help them to be very clear, what are the learning objectives? What are the benchmarks of performance? And how do we help our students where the variable is time? So if you take an exam and you fail it and you see what you missed, you can go back and demonstrate to your teacher that you actually know that. And that's super um, uh, effective for students who feel test anxiety that uh, say it's on, um, uh, I was a chemistry teacher, so say it was on titration and you go, I understand titration. I know what that's all about. Uh, you can come back and perhaps discuss it with your teacher that you understand the concepts behind it, you just don't test well. So I understand your anxiety because it's change, but I think we will have enough supports in place that you will see this as hugely equitable. Um, Jeffco has already moved to this, other districts have already moved to this, and this actually started in the early 90s, so it's almost 30 years old, um, so it's not anything new, it just brings equity, so you as a student, your parents, and the teacher are all sharing the same information, and you all have agreements. Um, I have a quick point to bring up, you keep mentioning that the, this new uh, grading schedule is to be for equity. Uh, I kind of have a comparison and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, in Virginia, they're currently uh, getting rid of higher grade math in an attempt to make uh, education more equitable to lower, uh, lower education who can't af afford to get higher math. And by doing that, you're reducing everyone else's education. Um, if we're put like example being for tests and uh, for tests and essays, if we can only get a one through five or one through four grading, how are we able to really see what we did wrong? Because like right now, for example, I'm in CE English and when I get my grade back for a test, say if I got a 93%, I can go and I can look in the rubric and I lost three points on my dote for it, meaning that I need to improve on the dote. If I got a three out of four, I have absolutely no idea what's wrong with it and how I can improve unless I take the time out of my day to go and intentionally talk to the teachers uh, about like everything that I did wrong. And I know that would have a lot to do with overwhelming the teachers too. So I'm, I'm a little bit confused on how this is improving the students. So Mrs. Dugan and Ms. MH, do you wanna take uh, how your perspective is on that one? 
Yes, I actually have a four o'clock I have to run to. I can jump right back on. It should only take about 10 minutes. I don't know if we'll still be here at that point, but um, I do want you to know that, especially for me and my perspective with standards-based learning, um, I'm looking at it from very much a, um, how this, from the lens of how this will affect our high school students and how we will um, make sure we're setting our students up for success on college applications and all of that. And it is a long process to getting to actually being a full on standards based learning and we absolutely will be having student voice on how we move forward with implementing it at the different school levels like we're already doing a lot of it at the elementary where their grading scales are one to four and um instead of a b c d whereas at high school like <laughs> I don't know exactly how it'll look, of course, yet, because we want to develop it in a team approach and not be mandated. But, you know, even if we go to having those different proficiency scales of one to four, like that four would still translate into a letter grade of an A. So it, do, it won't affect your, it won't make college applications more complicated. That is definitely not the intention with moving towards standards-based grading and learning. Uh, my only issue with the transferring it back over is you have to maintain almost entirely fours to get an A at the end of the year, making it more difficult to maintain a uh, A average. I can interject a little bit as well. So yes, that is um, a portion of that could be a misconception in all honesty, because a four doesn't necessarily equate to an A and a three doesn't necessarily equate to a B. This is the work that our team and our, our teacher team will be doing in this upcoming year. So we're not planning on launching everything all at once in August when we come back. And um, currently we have a teacher team that represents um, almost every department I'm thinking in my head, uh, but almost every department has a representative that is on that teacher team. We've had um, some administration leadership training in this, um, and we've had teacher training as well at different levels. And so that teacher team is going to be helping to um, get feedback from students and from staff um, as we move forward in the process. Right now, we're really just looking at the, the big beliefs of um, grades should represent what students know and can do. And, and having hard conversations regarding where does someone, you know, a homework assignment fit into that grading scheme. So um, right now we're just working with staff to talk through and come up with some agreements so that we can be more consistent across the board for all of our students and know that that every student could make those achievements and gains in any area um, with that clarity that we'll be providing. So just um, 402. And so um, we have enough time for let's do one more question. And then unfortunately, we're going to have to um, end this particular forum. Uh, we do plan on doing we've done once a month and that was feedback that we got from I believe our January um, forum so we can look at trying to do another one um, as soon as we can and um, additionally I would also encourage email um, additional questions like don't let it stop here right um, let's keep the conversation going um, but we have a parent one tonight and um, so and I know some folks have to jump on some other meetings still so let's get um, Luke you had another question. I wanted to oh. Ms. Emma could add if she wished um, as the leader of secondary, if she added, had anything to add to the concern or her perspective. Um, I'm happy to add quickly. I know we're running out of time and I know we have student questions and they're so important. The only things I would add one is that I am learning with this from the teacher leaders that have um, been on learning about standards based grading and are truly excited about how it's going to help students learn like which is ultimately our goal um, is thinking about standards based learning not just standards based grading so while I know the grades are so important um, and that especially at that high school level, but really think about how students can learn and I just wanted to comment on one thing about. Um, Someone says something about not getting feedback, like just getting a three and not knowing what that meant. Um, and I wanted to make sure that like in no means 
is standards-based learning going to mean that you'll get a 10 page essay back with a three on it and have no idea what that means? Absolutely. Your teachers will still be giving you in-depth feedback. You'll know what you, what to improve, what to work on, what was great. Um, that that might be at one of those misconceptions that Dr. Johnson was talking about, um, that you, you'll start getting work back with just a one or a two or a three on it with nothing else. And that is not the direction that we are intending to move. So if anything, it will give better feedback for students so that you know what, what areas you need to work on. And it won't be averaged either. So if it's not like we'll take all the numbers of the semester and that's the average. It's actually your proficiency on each standard. So if you achieve the grade level, which would probably be a three, uh, that would more than likely equate to an A, even if it took you the last day of the semester to prove that you are a three. So it's not an average. All right, um, Luke, did you have a question? Yes, I was thinking that standard space learning and grading is wonderful, but would it make more sense to keep the letter grades, have them still be the same percentage, and no matter what teacher, every assignment is worth 100 points? for each different category. So you'd have a different category for homework or tests or in school work. And that way you still have that depth of where you lost points on each different thing. And you'd have all the same grading system. Sounds like we need to add you to a uh, student advisory board for SBL. So uh, Ms. Gasser, um, she's, a, she's currently finishing up as our third, fourth grade teacher and next year she'll be moving full time into the role of uh, professional development coordinator and she's taking on a good portion of the SBL work. Um, so if you have some feedback for her, feel free to go ahead and shoot her an email. Um, we also have the feedback form on our website if you feel more comfortable using that form. Um, as soon as we have feedback that comes in, it gets tagged to the appropriate person and then they're aware. And then um, they also follow up using that form. That's a great way for us to track any feedback that comes in. So, um, so I'm, I'm so sorry. We had such a great conversation and um, great questions. Uh, we're gonna have to end this, um, but be on the lookout. We'll try and do another one here um, uh, pretty soon, hopefully. Um, try and get it on the calendar. We'll probably wait until after the week of um, STEM shares. Um, and, um, but do continue to reach out with your um, feedback. So I think that that's really helpful. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you guys so much for your time. Uh, I just had one quick thing. Um, I had a couple friends who weren't able to make it today and they had some similar questions. Uh, is there any way I could have access to the recording so they could uh, view some of your guys' answers? Yeah, so give me just uh, some time. I need to go through the list of all those who attended and make sure that they're media cleared so that I can um, share that. I didn't... Um, uh, let folks know at the start of it that I was recording it. So I at least need to make sure that everybody's media cleared. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye.